and Mr. Whitehurst will lead us with our invocation and pledge this morning. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, just thank you for allowing us to gather together today. Lord, help us make decisions that are best for our students. Lord, help lift those up that have sickness, have death in their family, Lord. And have a, um, please remember those that have resentment in their heart. Lord, I just pray that those wounds can be healed today, Lord. Just thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Whitehurst. We'll move on to adoption of the agenda. Mr. Superintendent has informed me that we will be taking item 7 and moving it to item 4 and 4 of course goes into 7th place no just re renumbering renumbering yes ma'am so we're just bringing the budget so line this lake to go Switching first to. so with that is there a motion to accept i make a motion to adopt the agenda second okay, there's a motion and a second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed same sign <coughs> motion passes Welcome everybody today. I know it was a little chilly in here, but I know we'll walk outside and be very, very hot in a little bit. And we will move on to asking Miss Lake to come up. So those are not all district students. So that's important to note as I walk through the growth in dollars, those are not all dollars that belong to Levy County. So just looking at total base funding, you'll see an increase of a little over $2 million. And it, of that $2 million, we have what's called additional weighted funding. Based on these programs, we get additional funding on that FTE. So advanced placement generates uh, additional FTE, so additional dollars. Isolated schools, which would be Cedar Key, small district ESE supplement, early graduation. The industry cert is uh, CAPE funding. And then, of course, dual enrollment. So of that little over $2 million, there was a $46,000 increase 
in those additional weighted funding. And those are important to note because most of those are in your assigned fund balance. Those are monies for specific activities within the school. So CAPE, for example, isn't open for consumption of all students. That is a CAPE budget that is uh, managed by Tanya Taylor. All right, so now we're going to get down into the categoricals, what's left of them. They Last year, they moved a lot of those categoricals up into the base student allocation, which is good and bad. Now, based on FTE, those are, are, are very sus, um, subject to change based on our FTE. So our categoricals that remain, you can see there's some growth in the discretionary compression. Some safe schools growth, ESE guarantee allocation had the most growth of 225,000. SAI, which uh, used, now it's called Educational Enrichment. Student Transportation, that is an estimate. You will see that Student Transportation line adjust again after the count in October, so in December. Usually we've overestimated that line, but that's just um, based on uh, an estimate, I believe, that comes through our F, uh, FEFP, or FTE that we do in January. And then, of course, the Mental Health Allocation. So there's an additional growth in categoricals of a little over 500,000 to make gross state and local increase of two point, almost 2.6 million. Then you, the required local effort is uh, local, local dollars. So we're looking at a growth in local dollars, so based off of the RLE of 721,000. So then you come along, you look at your net state FEFP, you reduce the local out, that net state FEFP is what the state of Florida says, we will give you 35 million if you will contribute 11 million. So the growth there is, for state only, is 1.8. Now you have to come along and you have to reduce. You have to either add or reduce for proration. This isn't the time of year you would see proration. You would see that mid-year in your third calculation, possibly your fourth. Prior year adjustments usually come out in your third calculation, and that is where the FEFP is adjusting for changes that happen after that count in February. Scholarships, you can see this year our scholarships were three point, almost 3.4. They're being estimated at 4.7 for next year. State funded discretionary supplement is just a pass through for scholarships. It's not our money, we don't see it, it's just a pass through for scholarships, but it does reduce the scholarship um, expenditure and on your, on your calculations. And then a prior year adjustment for scholarships, that comes out in the uh, third calculation and that's based on this year's count. So with all that said and done, the growth, we had over two million at the beginning when we started, now uh, adjusted net state after you reduce for scholarships, you're looking at $700,000 growth in state funding. You have your class size reduction, which is a state categorical, and it's growing a little over $1,000. So increase in total state funding, again, these aren't all our students, so we don't get all of this increase in funding, but uh, $709,000. Local funding is in the next slide in the green, and these are just estimates. The RLE will come out um, after July 1st. We will have the trim process will start, the RLE will be calculated, and we'll have better numbers, but these are usually pretty close. You see a local increase of around 876, 77,000. So before we reduce for FES, you're looking at a budget that looks like it has grown by 3 million, when in essence it's grown, grown by about 1.6 to include charters. All right, so what we do is we take that total state and local increase, and then we need to reduce it for any upcoming costs that we know are going to impact this year's budget. So we know built in that BSA is your teacher salary increase allocation, so we need to move that out. It's about 365000 We have an increase in health insurance. So last year the board uh, 
uh, approved taking on the total increase, but because insurance runs calendar year, we run fiscal year, six months of that increase hit this year's budget, the other six months will hit next year's budget, and it was a little over around 500000 that line does not mean the board has approved to pick up this year's increase. This is just the cost for picking up last year's. We have uh, an increase due to ARP where we're having to uh, shift some positions and programs around and bring into the general fund. So you're looking at around 400,000 for that. And then we have an increase in FRS. This year was the smallest increase we've seen in the last few years. So that was a positive. You reduce that and then you have what's called flexible funds. Those are funds that when we start to negotiate, we start doing uh, a certain activities, we look at what we have left and we call those flexible funds. Just a quick snapshot of the change in scholarships. Most of you have seen this. All I've done this year is uh, change 23-24, that's actual. 3.3 and then added the estimate of 4.7. So you can see in 1718, when it was just McKay, we were losing around 536,000 to scholarships. Now we're on target to losing over 4.7 million. So let's look at revenues where we are this year, where we think we're going to end. Uh, finance moves at a rapid pace. As I've been standing here talking, these numbers have probably already changed. So this was as of yesterday afternoon. We are on target to collect 99% of the revenues that we've projected. And those will be general fund. <coughs> Next are expenditures. So we're on target to expend about 98% of the expenditures. One thing I wanted to point out that might look odd is if you look at the line for materials and supplies, it looks like we've only, we're only gonna spend about 50% of that line. And that's because you have budgeted items that are what we call roll forward. They come from the assigned fund balance. So you have about 300,000 to schoolhouse that um, is in charge, our principals are in charge of that budget. They spend those budgets, but they don't um, erode them. They roll them from year to year. So that's been budgeted there, but we anticipate about 300,000 rolling to next year's budget. There's about 200,000 in textbooks in there. This wasn't an adoption year. So some of those funds uh, were unspent that again, will we'll roll to next year. And then you have about 330,000 of a CAPE budget that sits there. Some of that will roll, some of that was budgeted in a five object, which meant, means materials and supplies, but it might have been spent as capital outlay. And that just happens. There's so many different code combinations of how these budgets can be spent that they aren't always in the right object until the expenditure line shows up. So that accounts for almost 900,000 of that line. So really, that what was meant to be spent will be spent. <laughs> moving a little fast I want to stop right there and just does anybody have any questions when you did the last one I remember with the change of the monies being rolled into the BSA and the categoricals being cut um, I think you estimated about a nine hundred thousand dollar loss mm -hmm. is that still in your that will show, figures or is that going to show that will show when we end but there's a lot of moving parts in that so when you're estimating a budget in the begin beginning all you can do is look at your revenues that are coming the FT that has been forecasted and assume minimal change but as the year goes on you have people coming and going you have high-end people retiring low-end people filling the seat vice versa so what you project in the beginning as you get closer to the end of the year becomes reality. <laughs> Thank you. And I do believe we made some adjustments last year to offset some of that loss as well. Um, the next are change in revenues. I picked 18, 19 pre-COVID and we're comparing this year. And we're kind of just looking at what have we done? Where have revenues went from 18, 19 to now? 
at the end of this fiscal year. You can see revenues have grown at almost 17%, but when you start to think about what's happened in these past few years to make that growth, we've had the <coughs> SR1, SR2, SR3, so that's been a relief to general fund. You've had an uh, increase of $15 an hour house bill, was it 5001 that $15 an hour. You've had increases in TSIA, millions put into TSIA. Uh, so that's where the majority of that increase is coming from. But what's interesting to note and to kind of understand how the FEFP works and how that RLE works as I went through that breakdown is if you notice, state revenues are only up 12%, but local is up 33 That's what RLE does. RLE reduces state, brings on can bring on uh, local. So you start to see where, now dollar-wise, obviously the state gives us far more revenue than local, but when you look at growth, you see the, in the increased growth in RLE as compared to the state. <coughs> All right, next we're gonna look at the expenditures. And this is by object. So it's salaries all across the board for everybody you see a total increase in expenditures. At the same time, revenues grew close to 17%. We've had expenditures grow close to 21%. The largest growth is in benefits, and that is being driven by two things. That's being driven by the increase in salaries, but mainly by the increase in FRS. And then purchase services has increased and energy services. The very bottom line other expenditures, and I meant to bring these costs, I'll try to do it at my next meeting, sub costs are, I mean, huge. I don't have a better word than huge. Our sub growth and sub costs, and you're capturing that and other expenditures has just ballooned. At a time when our salaries have increased, our subs have increased too, so it's like, <laughs> And it's not because sub costs have increased, it's just because we need to utilize the subs. All right, so let's take a quick look at a change in employee wages. I think it's important to take at least a couple times a year to reground yourself in what we've done over the past few years because as we get through a cycle of negotiations, a cycle of compensation ending, it, it, we just move into a new year and we don't talk about what happened last year. Um, but we've had a lot of good things happen in the last few years. So since 1819, we've seen a growth in, uh, in salaries of 18% out of the general fund, 30% out of food service, and 63% out of the federal for 21% growth overall, almost 22 in salaries. But the FRS, we've grown almost 93% in FRS. That's just FRS growth alone. Again, as your salaries grow, that gets higher, but also as the rate increases, it gets higher. <laughs> We've seen over that, now I'm just looking at base pay, so uh, what a new teacher would come into our district with. I'm not looking at all the different increases across pays, but our base pay has increased from 36000 to 47.5, so that's almost a 32% increase in five years. ESP starting pay has increased almost 45%. And that would be in two years. And then you see the 7% increase in administrative base pay at the same time. So the starting the TSIA grew at 31%. So you can see the majority of that growth uh, is because since 2021 in the uh, implementation of TSIA. And then House Bill was not last year, but prior year. And we have not changed minimum wage off $15 yet. So that's why it's just saying one year. But that grew 30% almost in one year. <coughs> All right, uh, quickly let's look at employee health insurance costs. So since 1718, you can see though in the pink, those are the monthly premiums for employees. And then the green would be the monthly premiums supported by the board. And you can see the growth in those between 1718 and 2324, and the change in the total monthly premium. So since 1718, total monthly premiums have grown a little over $116. 
with the board picking up 103 of that growth and employees picking up $13. So when you look at what percent employees pay of, of monthly premiums versus the board, we're at 87 to a, around just under 13% more by the employee. We've had some benefit in that area from ESSER as well, that again is sunsetting, that has reduced those COVID claims and we've used that to uh, decrease some huge growth in claim. Real quick, enrollment's not my area, <coughs> Morgan's, but I like, as we're talking about the budget, let's just go back and kind of look at some of those numbers, look at what we have in charters from May 19 to now, Homeschool, the growth is just, again, huge for lack of a better word, in homeschool. Scholarships change a little bit. We don't have a quarter of a human being in scholarships, but in May 19, uh, MIS did all the reporting. DOE is doing the reporting now and feeding it back to us. So what you see is enrollment in his number of 96, and what you see in the new number is what we would call weighted FTE. So it's... <laughs> It's a little hard to compare, but usually they're not off too much, too, too much. Um, but you can see of the 6,316 uh, enrollment, uh, about 1,250 of those are going somewhere other than our schools. Real quick, I really haven't changed this slide much because we still are facing the same challenges we were facing back in, in 16, 17, 17, 18. We have limited resources. With those resources, what and how do we address the challenges? We're still looking at salary compression across all schedules. We're still uh, combating health insurance increases. We've done a good job not passing that on to the employee, but at some point we've got to uh, make sure we have enough board, board contribution to continue that. Uh, increased technology needs. I am meeting with MIS and they are just trying their best to figure out how to meet these needs. They know that at some point there's going to be, for lack of a better word, a cliff for them. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how to ensure that all students and staff have what they need uh, to meet those needs. ESSER is going away. ESSER, the last little bit of ESSER will end in September. We have inflation. You saw that when I showed you the growth of cost for this year compared to 1819, uh, it's just across the board. And then we still uh, compete with our, our battle underfunded or unfunded mandates. And you really are seeing those in the areas of school safety, mental health. Those are huge areas um, that just don't have sufficient funding to make every mandate, to meet every mandate. So those have to be met, so those funds come from those flexible dollars that ordinarily we would be looking at compensation with. And then of course recruitment and retention. I think it gets a little bit better every year, but we are still battling that lapse time in those positions being left vacant, someone leaving, someone coming back in. We notice that they're coming in quicker, but as the economy continues to worsen, you will see people staying in their chairs longer. So you will not have a, a fund balance that is being built by that last time. You will start to see stability in those seats. If we have stability in those seats, but continue meeting subs at the rate that we do, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> it's going to be problematic. So that is my budget workshop for this year. Uh, next time we meet, we'll go through the proposed budget. We'll look at uh, this year upcoming budget, and we'll look at where have a better idea where we're going to end this year. Believe it or not, we keep our books open until the middle of August. If anybody have any questions, that was a lot of information. That's a lot of information. Yeah. I have a couple. Absolutely. And, and this is more opinion stuff. How do we how do we slow down that sub cost? How do we how can we I don't have a good answer for that. We I have thought of multiple things, reached out to uh, my counterparts in other districts and seeing what they've tried by way of incentive, incentives. Um, sometimes it's just due to a vacancy. Um, so you're going to have the offset cost in that. Other times it's truly a person, you know, not able to come in that day and you're having to fill that with some cost. 
Um, right now, we're all facing the same thing, and we don't all we don't have any good answers. Okay. All right. So that, that was that was one. My second one is when we look at this um, when we look at our salaries. Mm -hmm. I think we're doing a good job keeping up with the increases over the years, mm -hmm. but I am troubled by that administrative base pay only seven percent. Inflation is basically those people are getting paid the same as they did in, if you figure in inflation. Really less, uh, probably. Yeah, maybe <laughs> less when you figure inflation in. So, in my thoughts, maybe we need to look at doing a little bit better for administration. because. So, where you're seeing this really be the um, hard, it's not in the retention of the current administration you have now because this is base pay, but it's very hard to recruit on that salary schedule. Because mm -hmm. this is where people come in. Once you come in as a principal or AP and you've been here a year and you qualify for performance pay, you get to move off that schedule. It's that um, competing for very limited resources across multiple counties is very hard when your recruitment tool is lower than theirs. So is that, that's where you're seeing that's, that would be the piece. Is that base close to what our neighbors are doing? Oh, it, I, last time I looked, it is... Of course, we can't compete with Marion or Lachlan, and it's, it's way lower than theirs, but we're pretty good with Dixie and Gilbert. Yeah, when, when I say our neighbors, I mean people that are realistically yeah. like us. What we can do, what we are having an issue with competing, not just admin, but even instructional, is not so much ESP, but instructional and admin is as you start to have those years of growth. So just trying to keep that in mind. I keep this in front of the board as the board makes decisions moving forward and how we can adjust those salary schedules, not just for retention, but for recruitment. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, th I think right now we have a great bunch of administrators, but it's inevitable because we have great ones. They will get offers from a place we're going to replace those people. It's a very limited resource, you are right. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. That's all I have. Thank you for all your help on our system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the motion passes to walk your Okay, the second thing I'm here to talk to you about is an update on the warehouse project. 
we're almost to the finish line. We have uh, our balance of our site work being completed as we speak. That should be done this week, the, the balance of the site work. Then we'll have SOB come in for retention ponds. We have some uh, awnings to put between the buildings and some awnings, finishing off the awnings underneath that we'll do in-house. Uh, we have some landscaping still to do and some gutters and just a few little odds and ends that's too minute to talk about. But right now, well, as far as the budget's concerned, our budget was Four hundred and seventy-seven. Yes. 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 Four thousand. And to date, we have spent four hundred twenty-one thousand eight hundred sixty-seven dollars and forty-nine cents. We have a balance left in site work and paving, landscaping, which we won't be paving. $31,921.25. Of that, we have $18,929.25 encumbered, which means we have a purchase order for it. It hasn't spent yet. That's what's going to pay for the balance of the site work that's being completed now. So that will leave $13,000 in that budget for the saw, the landscaping, stuff such as that. Also, we have incidentals, which is the covered walkways and just anything that doesn't fall into one of these other categories. Uh, we have $23,203.26 left in that budget. And of that, $2,101.33 is already encumbered. That's for the awning that we purchased that we're going to install between the warehouse building, office building to cover the walkway for MIS. So they bring their computers back and forth to work on the outer weather. That leaves us $21,101.93 for remaining in that line item. We have some concrete to do in the other retention pond like we've done in this retention pond. We have gutters to install and we'll finish underneath those existing awnings also with this money. Have one more thing we're going to try to do if there's enough money in the budget. So we'll see about that when that time gets here. And uh, I think I was hoping to be standing up here telling y'all we were finished, <laughs> but that didn't happen. So uh, I'm trying to let you know where we're at. Um, the bid will be due in August. I'm not sure of the date because I don't have it in front of me, but for the Paving, and that'll be the, the last button on Joe's shirt. We'll be wrapping it up when we get that bid. So that we'll have, should have everything complete prior to August, except for that paving. So, so with the budget now, this paving, it says on your, it's due on August 7th. Yeah. The, the deadline is August 7th. So with that, on the bid for the paving, mm -hmm. do you think that will everything will be in line with that bid coming in and the funds that are there now? I think so, because we, like I said, we have the money for the, from the fuel tax that that paving's coming out of. So we got, we got money there, and I think from our previous budget for paving, we should be okay with that. We don't have to we increased that. it last year, right? Didn't we vote to increase some added funds Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am, we did. $77,000. 77, <laughs> and, uh, and no, we don't need more. I just want to let you know where we at. Does uh, anybody have anybody else have any questions? Thank you. Thank you for the update. Yeah, appreciate it, Breezy. We'll look forward to the tour. We'll be there yeah. once we get to the tour. <laughs> and we're already using it, so once you get a tour, you'll see <laughs> what it's like in action. Uh, also wanted to update you on a couple other things. The roofing project at Wilson Elementary, <coughs> they're in full swing over there on building 600. 
We've exposed a lot of damaged wood that our team's been on top of and replacing as we go. And we tackled the worst part of it first, so we think we're pretty good shape on that. We still we know we're gonna find more, but we knew one area. So they're on on target and <clears throat> I uh, went by Bronson Elementary, and we have a big, pretty new covered play area over there, if you like to in by. It's a nice, nice looking building. They're putting the finishing touches on them. Today, they should be wrapped up before the end of the week. And once they get everything up and the fence taken down, I encourage y'all to go look at that you know, once we get the site finished up. Any other questions? They didn't paint Go Indians or anything on top of it, did they? They probably did. Arrows. <laughs> no, I'm Same sure the arrows involved will be Mountain Eagle up there somewhere. How's that retention wall in Yankee Town? I know Miss Westfall was talking like that oh, play yes, area, that little yes, retention just, wall. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's going to be cross ties. <coughs> they keep referring to it as a wall, but it's going to be, we're going to cut it back, put some cross ties there, and we'll have that done in time for the people to come in and finish the little edge of the court the way they want um, before school starts. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, Mr. Stein. Thank you all. We'll move on to agenda item five. Dr. Hamlin. <laughs> This year, um, we, uh, I came up and I talked about the Cognia um, accreditation process with you all um, and kind of gave you a rundown of what it was going to look like. So um, from there, I'm going to explain uh, what we did and the review process by um, Cognia and the results of that. So the first thing we did was we um, had some, uh, we had stakeholder input, we had our presentation to Cognia in February, and then we were provided feedback a couple months later in April. For the stakeholder input, the first thing we did is um, we came together as district instructional team leaders along with school personnel, um, and we facilitated input with um, everybody on our district instructional team, including the superintendent, and we all rated the key characteristics um, that uh, of the Cognia framework, um, and where we fell, um, where we felt we fell based on our work in the district. Um, from there, um, um, schools and the district staff, um, we created folders and imported <coughs> a ton of evidence to support our ratings that we provided for ourselves um, from the the characteristics that Cognia puts out. Um, then our, um, we have specific leaders. There were four characteristics, um, and each uh, there were, um, one DIT um, leader uh, did the narrative and the final ratings for each of those characteristics. Um, and then myself and Ms. Lewis, we worked on the, um, the student achievement data and analysis. I worked on the executive summary and then putting it all together and wrapping it up in a big package for Cognia. Um, it was a lot, a lot of work. Um, I will say I, we couldn't have done this without the team effort that we all did put into it um, so that we gave our, breath, our best representation of our district um, for the accreditation team. We conducted surveys with families. Um, that was something that we were um, lacking and so we were able to put surveys out. Um, Cognia provides us with some surveys for parent input. We had already collected surveys from teachers and students through our AVID agency surveys, so we were able to use those, those results. Um, and then, uh, again, we had an executive summary detailing our district and in-depth data analysis. So it was a big package of um, everything that we do, including our student achievement and about us as a district. So in December, all that required documentation and the narratives were provided to Cognia for their review prior to accreditation. So we, we provide everything to them. They, per, they go through a process of um, evaluating the documents that we gave them and the ratings. So they cross um, analyze those things. And then um, we came together in February and we put together about a 45 minute presentation um, that included an overview of our districts. 
our strengths and areas needing improvement based on that accreditation process. And you know, 45 minutes, you feel like it's a long time, but it's not a lot of time. I mean, you can only, you gotta synthesize and come up with um, some real strengths that you wanna highlight and really hone in on those areas that you need, you are identifying as a need of improvement. Um, so within our organization, um, as a whole as a district, um, we identified three um, strengths that were um, significant. So the first one was our assessment data and collection of data. Um, and we have um, all the data that we collect in the district is what is used to drive instruction with our students. It also is something that we use um, to determine professional learning um, so that we can um, best serve our students by um, growing our, um, our teachers and our leaders. The second strength that we had was professional learning collaborative structures between um, our, um, our collaboration that teachers have within our professional learning days, um, our school improvement days where they're working together, and our cadres. This is really where teachers have the voice to, um, to provide their input to our work. Um, they're the experts. Um, and so we want them to have as much input as possible and we provide that capacity to them by bringing them into those situations to really build on that and make sure that they have, um, they have a say in what's going on in our district and they're helping to drive that, um, that instruction in the classrooms. Um, we, um, our cadres meet in the spring. We usually do a lot of that work um, either throughout the year or through um, in the summer but there's such a need for us to have things ready for schools in the by summer because they take some of that time and start planning for the next year so we've um, responded to that and are trying to provide all of that um, support to them and that work in the spring so they're able to lead that um, improvement in the summer um, and then finally um, safety and security was um, a, a strong strength of ours we have policies and procedures in place to ensure that our students are, and staff are, are kept safe throughout the day. And that was a real highlight um, in the, when we peeled back all the layers. There's, it's amazing when you go through all these indicators, um, all the characteristics and every, um, and you're rating yourself, how you peel back all those layers of what's going on and you can really um, do a deep dive into what's going on in the school district. And um, that was, um, these two things were definitely a strength within our organization. We had a lot of other strengths, but to help really hone in on those three things. Um, was telling and then um, so we had some student achievement highlights as well and before I get into the highlights I want to talk a little bit about how difficult um, it was to assess student achievement so you're talking about the last if we're looking at longitudinal data um, the last five years what did we have we COVID we had new standards and new curriculum and so for us to look at data um, longitudinally we it was a struggle because you're looking at totally different standards um, compared to other standards and so student performance is off, is off because it's not apples to apples it's apples to oranges so um, with that being said we were able to glean some insight off of that and our first um, achievement was um, graduation rate data that is a that was one of our um, our strongest uh, indicators here with a 95.4% graduation rate which put us fourth in the district so that was um, that was truly telling and there's a graph that kind of shows our graduation rate over the years um, and how that has improved our next strength was ELA achievement and um, again because of the discrepancy in data we were really pulling through um, trying to determine what our strengths were there and we honed in, and by the way, when you're going through this data, you're just not looking at all kids. We're looking at students with disabilities. We're looking at our other subgroups of ELL, Hispanic, um, um, African American. And so we're really digging deep. And some of those strengths that we found was that our students with disabilities, um, achievement was above the state average at 28% um, compared to 24%. And, and that's 21-22. So it, it was really hard at the, when we were doing this, we had to look at last year's data because this year's data wasn't available. Um, and so um, <coughs> this is what we were able to glean. However, uh, we've, we've decreased a little bit in um, what, at this data point, um, slightly um, with students with disabilities. 
um, but it was definitely notable that we've been maintaining above the state average. So again, you're talking about different crops of kids too along the way, so it's, um, we have to take that into consideration. Um, what I will say is that, um, I'll wait for the next slide. Um, I want to talk about something else. Um, math achievement. So our students with disabilities achievement, again, above the state average, which is um, mark, uh, it was remarkable. And then um, overall our math achievement is showing a positive trend for all learners since 2021. Now, um, I believe you guys recognize this, that our math data took a huge hit. Across the state, it took a huge hit when COVID came um, through. And so now we're slowly, slowly making our way back Again, new standards, new learning, new curriculum, but we're making our way back up um, based from that, on that. Um, in the area of closing the achievement gap, we have a strength with our students with disability, again, math data um, being above the state average. And then all students, uh, leading students, are trying are closing that achievement gap with a six point difference compared to the state average <coughs> in, re, um, in math. So again, that is a, that is a strength that we're seeing. What I will say is back um, in for, for ELA achievement, um, we it wasn't submitted to the to Cognia because this, this date is fresh and it's not even um, been finalized yet by the state. But we're projecting a three percent increase in ELA achievement overall in our district with all students, um, and then we have shown with math achievement in all students a six percent increase. So um, that just adds on to that growth with math, which is great. And then we're, sh we're starting to see that growth again with, um, with reading. Um, okay, so areas of improvement. We have to identify things that we want to improve upon. Um, again, we have that slight decrease in ELA proficiency over time, but we're showing that increase in uh, at 3%. Um, we have a decrease in achievement of subgroup data for ELLs and African Americans. Um, and they have that largest gap to compare to their peers and the state. So um, it's a goal of ours to really hone in on that subgroup data. We do it at the school level intentionally with um, ESSA subgroups um, that are identified within their school improvement plan and they make, can make goals and actions specific to those subgroups that are, um, that are affected within their school. But we as a district need to look um, more closely at how we can support our ELLs and African Americans so that they can make the gains um, compared to their peers and the state average. And finally, we do recognize, although our students with disabilities are, per are performing above the state average, um, they're not performing at the level of their non-disabled peers. So how can we help increase that? Um, and one of the deficits from this um, overall looking at this is we didn't have learning aids to look at. And that could be something that um, really could be telling how we're moving our students, but we had to look strictly at proficiency um, in this whole process because of the um, lack of consistent test scores um, with the similar tests to be able to see learning aids. So we're looking forward to being able to analyze learning aids moving forward with the state and determine if we're making those gains slowly but surely with those subgroups and with all students. So feedback um, from our presentation was um, Cognia, um, our writers uh, that we presented to, said that we were thorough and transparent in our analysis. We did not hide where we needed, um, we needed to work, where we needed to improve our work, um, and they recognized that, um, which made it a little bit easier for them to provide feedback because we already identified things that we needed to improve, which is not something they needed to tell us. Um, we identified our strengths and areas of need improvement, which, um, which they noted that in the report that I believe was given to you by, um, in your board docs, that is the full report, reading report that we um, received from them in April. So that report came through. Within each characteristic in the report, the suggestions resonated what we had already identified as a need. Um, Cognia provided their own ratings of standards, which gave us an overall index of educator quality score of 306. So they take all the ratings and they look at it. Um, and from there, these were the breakdowns. There were below 200, between 220 and 300, and then above 300. And I'm proud to say that we were rated at 306. So we were at the, that higher end of the rating. So um, we met expectations for accreditation. Um, they will be checking in with us um, after three years um, and as like a pulse point before we move into accreditation after another five. Um, and then, I think there's one more. 
Our next steps, we're going to work on our self-identified actions, which include that expanding that longitudinal data to represent all subgroups, like I spoke about, um, and, uh, and analyze that data. We're going to um, use yearly use of surveys, because I can tell you that um, we had only one year of that, uh, of these teacher and the educator exigency surveys that we were using district-wide. So now we can collect that every year and, um, and analyze that data, as well as parent survey data and being consistent with the same survey that we use. Um, we're going to uh, continue that professional learning on explicit instruction um, to increase that student engagement and teacher effectiveness and we're going to use all information to make district actions for improvement. Um, one of the suggestions, the only suggested action from Cognia, which um, I thought was telling, was that we need to design and use PD days that are relevant and effective in supporting teacher growth. And some brainstorming in that area would be to um, <coughs> provide teachers that opportunity with, and I hate to survey people <coughs> this, but how else are we going to get everybody's voice if they don't have that opportunity to um, provide feedback and after each um, <coughs> improvement or professional development day, ask them, what do, you, what do you think you would need for future PD? What do you think we could do to improve the school improvement days um, and what they would need in that when they are spending that time together? And then we're going to use all the feedback from um, the accreditation process along with some other factors to start working on a strategic plan that'll last us from 2024 to 2029. Our, strategic, our st current strategic plan is sunsetting, and so we need to work on a new strategic plan, um, which is going to be our way of work, um, <coughs> probably starting in August, the beginning of August. And then um, we're going to provide Cognia <coughs> with that progress on the actions related specifically to the PD um, days feedback that they asked for. Any questions? <laughs> That's amazing. For them to only have one recommendation out of yeah. all of that information. That's right. And you know, when you're um, when you're going through this process, you tend to rate your you tend to beat yourself up a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Self reflect. Yeah. And um, so we, um, I wouldn't say we rated us. Um, significantly lower, but they rated us higher than we saw ourselves. So that was another thing that I thought that was um, telling because um, they saw our work that we put together as um, a great representation of meeting the characteristics that um, they put into play for accreditation. I love how they see a strength of ours, which I agree, sorry Cameron, is with our data collection because it's been such, I've, in the however long I've been on the board, to see the way we now collect data and use that to make our whole district better mm -hmm. that's it's huge mm -hmm. so it's and one of the things that I do like what I mean obviously not with state assessments but we usually get blueprints for state assessments so we have an idea but at least the assessments that we're using that are um, within our district they have input into and so they are well aware of the standards that are covered and um, and teachers really know what they're what are the um, high priority standards that students are going to be assessed on um, at the end of the year, mid-year mid exams, end of year exams. Um, and then um, I can say personally just working through social studies and, um, and with, with the science teachers, Michelle and I both um, worked to do, a, they wanted to move straight to common assessments. They don't want to create their own assessments anymore. So one of our ways of work for the school improvement days is going to, they're going to look at the first quarter assessments, here are all the item choices. They're going to pick that. We're going to put in performance matters. And then we're going to be able to have unified data um, in science and social studies. We already have it for ELA, and we already have it for math. So to me, the teachers wanting to do that says a lot about what they see in the data and how it can help their instruction in the classroom. So the teachers aren't wanting to make their own final. No. They're, want they're wanting to, have they wanting to use that. I thought, that. I, I, was, I was really <coughs> impressed that they wanted to do that. I gave them the, I gave them the option, and so, um, and that's the way they wanted to move. So mm -hmm. I was happy about that because I think that that data can be really telling and help um, our students. Yeah. Does Cognia have a team also that looks at the data but also goes into the um, schools? Don't they have representatives? So they used follow? to. Okay. So what they, the old process was um, is that they would come and visit a school district. Um, and I think they may do that when you're new to the accreditation process. Okay. Um, but now what they do is they, um, and it used to be, and I was in the first accreditation process. <laughs> As a school leader, it took a ton of time to gather all that. Now they're, they're seeing that a lot of things come district, are district initiatives or the district has um, 
the ability to grab the things that we need. So we were able, as a district, to be able to provide that evidence um, because we streamlined as much as possible for the schools, and then the schools were able to input the, their specific things that they, uh, pieces of evidence that they felt were um, um, contributed to our rating in um, um, for the characteristics and the standards under the characteristics. So they don't do that, but the, what they do do now is the there was a team of, there were only two people, but um, they were on that presentation that we provided, we did it virtually. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is they tell us basically that um, after that presentation, they give us the report, um, and then um, they kind of kind of gradually do this right then and there, um, as I recall. Um, and then, but they said a final accreditation has to go to their board um, in June, which should be any day now. I was going to reach out, um, and then they will have where they do put their official stamp of approval mm -hmm. with the board, and then they'll send us um, our final award. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Did, Appreciate it. And I'm wanting to be sure I understood what you said. Did a minute ago you say that teachers wanted the common test instead of creating their own test? That's right. For, <coughs> for, um, for assessment throughout the school year, not just their end of course exams or their, um, um, those are already created. They're like semester, sometimes their semester tests or their end of year tests. Since we have a new curriculum, they wanted to use what is provided in the curriculum, identify if that's meeting those questions or meeting the the standards because curriculum provides assessments and then they wanted um, and it's going to be a little work on our part because you know teachers got a lot to do so we try to help them at the district level to make those assessments so that they're readily available to them so Miss Eastman and I um, are going to work on those for science and social studies throughout the year including second through fifth grade we back up a little bit they also wanted them and so we're, we're working on those as well so from the aspect of data yes. that's probably better Oh, it's there. But from the aspect of teacher educating the child mm -hmm. and what the child is actually learning in class, is that better? And I'm asking that sort of a leading question because we, I'm sure y'all hear it too, we hear it all the time. We're teaching to the test, not teaching the kid. Doesn't that fall into we're teaching to a test, not teaching a kid? I always say that the test is made of standards. So if you're teaching your test standards, you're teaching to the test. So it's, it's knowing the difference between teaching the item types of the test so students are aware of the kind of questions that are going to be asked. The standards are the standards. And if you're teaching to the depth of the standard, then the students should be able to apply their learning of the standard to the question that's being asked. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I can't, okay, I'm old. Mm -hmm. And we'll okay. admit I'm old. But I can remember being in school, being in, being in school here, right. and we had one teacher. Voice privacy contents have been updated. Oh. <laughs> <Did you get> <laughs> <that>? <laughs> I had one teacher who, you, you had this very standardized test that was obviously from a book or from whatever, and that's what she did. Boom. Then we had another teacher who, he made his own tests, and they were, this is what we had learned. This is what we had discussed. And naturally, in that moment, you know, the grade was about the same in both. You know, the grade was about the same. But now here I am. I'm 40 years away from that. The things I was tested on by the guy that made the test, I still hold that information to this day and can reiterate that and can do it. The one that did that standardized test, having had three children go through our system, I've had to help those children with schoolwork. And when we got to that stuff, none of that stuff stuck. But I could pass that test. I had some great data. But did I actually learn it? And was I actually tested to see, did I learn it? And I'm not knocking anybody on this. I, that, don't take that way. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am raising the point that I would say hundreds of parents ask me all the time. Mm -hmm. And there are questions, this question goes, and so when somebody says, well, we're just going to take the, the common test and do that. That bothers me because of my own personal experiences. So the beauty of um, what we're doing is that teachers will look at the item samples for the, that meet the letter of the standard, and they'll determine if they need to adjust the wording, if maybe a distractor, which is your answer choices, um, maybe they're too close, too similar, that it's tricking the students. They're going to have input in those kinds of questions. So it's not like we're just going to pick numbers one, five, seven, eight, blah, 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 in from that test and apply it. They're going to have, those tests are totally customizable. Oh, so those sure. questions can be, here's the item question, do you like it? 
is there something wrong with it? Do we need to tweak it? Then let's do that, and then they'll have their common assessment. And any good teacher always starts with the assessment. It's backward design. You're looking at this, the standards. Does your test meet the letter of the standard? And what does your test require um, asking of your student? And then you, you design your instruction based on that. It's not the test you're, you're designing your instruction around. It's the standard. And the yes, test but what you just said. Just related to the standards. But what you just said basically paints a picture of yes. We are <coughs> adjusting to the test because you said we look at the assessment first. The test. Right. We keep calling it an assessment. The test. We look at the test first, and then we gear things to that. Mm -hmm. That's teaching to the test, as far as I'm concerned. Like if we were sitting here, and, and here's something we all know about: the Declaration of Independence. We're going to teach a class on Declaration of Independence. We wouldn't start by going, okay, here's the assessment, let's make it fancy. We wouldn't have a cadre and talk about the assessment. We'd have a meeting and go, here's what we need to teach about the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. This is what bothered me, and I've gotten completely off subject. Mm -hmm. So when we say, we're going to look at the assessment first, and then we're going to go, that's teaching to the test. Instead of sitting here going, hey, the Declaration of Independence was written this day, da, 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 these are the guys, da, 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 and give the child the information so that 40 years later, We've retained it. I'd much rather know that 40 years later, the kid knows all about the Declaration of Independence, than a week from now, he could pass that test. Right. And that's what worries me. When I hear the word, we're going to use common test. I like the fact that you did come back and say, hey, look, it's not just, this is the test, take it. We can adjust that. So that there is some work that goes in on our part right, to make it time. fit our need. But that's, that's, that was my point. And I'm sorry it's to beat okay. that horse. And I, I know it works great for data. Sure. Works great for data. Mm -hmm. but But... Here's the weird thing, and I feel this way, and I've always felt this way. That kid over there is not data. We have to work on data, but that kid's a kid. It's that just kid. a piece of the puzzle. Let's that, that kid, the whole student. we need to look at the whole thing. And that, that's what worries me on those standardized tests and saying the common test, because I really do look at 40 years from now, I want you to know about this stuff. I understand that. Um, I think though we're doing a disservice to student, we're doing a disservice to students, and we're also not following the letter of the law for the state of education, uh, the Board of Education, if we're not teaching the standard. And that question should lead to the standard. How else do you prove that a student, or ask a student if they understand that content, if we don't have a formal way of, of, of asking them or getting that knowledge Just from them? And I feel like um, if we're sticking to the standard and making sure that assessment question is what we're teaching our student and it's tied to the standard, then we're doing our um, we're doing what we need to do. I feel like it's almost a double-edged sword in a way. You can't win. You can't. I mean, I, we're, I'm old yeah. too, and we had the math teacher, Billy Sue Johnson, that was amazing, and you learned, and she created that test, and mm -hmm. you were strong in math forever. But times have changed. You look at our sub costs. So the, the turnover with teachers, we don't have you, So now, to me, it's important that that sub is plugged in, the standards are being taught, because I have teenagers where they would come home yeah, I think I did okay, but there were things that I did not learn about this yeah. year on that test. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so that, we've heard that. We've heard that from schools. We've heard that from parents. And so that's why if we're more of, uh, if we're using something that's common, then can we make sure that the teachers have what they need to get the, to be able to um, teach the students to the standards and we're not um, providing kids with tests that maybe are not covered in content. And I think another thing to keep in mind is, um, and no, I'm not disrespecting any teacher that taught you, but did they teach it to the level or the information? Was that to the level that it needed to be taught? That's the question. I can guarantee sitting right here, right now today, and no insult to anyone. That's okay. And we'll, we'll right. for example, that particular teacher taught history. Mm -hmm. I know more details about history of this country mm -hmm. than a child that graduated last year mm -hmm. from the same school I graduated from, in detail, but, but, on Friday, they probably could have done better on a standardized test than I did, because that's what it was geared to. I'm not knocking that, and, and I like the fact that you addressed, this is my problem with the test, and it's not you, it's not you. This is a battle we're not fighting among ourselves, this is a battle higher up than us. My problem with the standardized test is, we're learning how to take tests, not necessarily learning how to, our children, in my opinion, we know how to take a test because we have sat there with our children. I have said this to myself. Look here, on that test, you're going to have a trick. It's going to seem just like the right answer. You're going to have two you can throw out. It's figuring out if the trick or the, or the other one. And, I, and it's knowing how to take the test. I'd much rather you know all about that thing than how to take that test. And, and that's, I'm, I'm going to let it go at that. I, I think that 
just to, to end on it, I would say that that's why it's even more important to build other data points besides a test. So how are those kids applying those skills? And I think that's where we come into play with science experiments. We come into research uh, projects with uh, social studies, um, applying those skills in ELA and math as well into real life scenarios. And then we know they're applying their knowledge in more ways than just a test. Excellent. Okay. And I think that gets back more to what I've said before. Yes, Teacher knows more about how that kid's doing yes, than those assessments. Yes, and you have to have standards <coughs> and if, because if you don't have those quality right. teachers, and they, they are not all quality, mm -hmm. you have to have some kind of baseline. But at sure. the end of the day, I mean, in my opinion, the state, it has been, you've rethought the wheel so much on all of these standardized tests and all of that because at the end of the day if you're if you're college bound all that really matters is that ACT so you need to know your algebra the basic that's the test that should be taught to I mean the ACT SAT but all of these little tests I will, I will say I'm really proud of the um, work that our instructional teams have done with teachers over the years because our maps are so good now that teachers it anybody walking in the door experienced or not because we're seeing a lot of people that come kind of right. in teaching that don't have experience have the tools necessary to be able to teach right. um, to teach kids so yeah. I'm proud of that yeah. one. Yeah. Teaching out of field. So yeah. I mean, you got to tell them like right. five, five years. Right. I mean, so how, yeah. Yeah. Our goal was how do we support everybody from the veteran to the novice. So. Yeah, it's a different world. It works. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Sorry. I got sidetracked. <laughs> Par for the Item course. six on the agenda, Mrs. Overs. Par for the course. Sounds good. Sorry, you didn't go Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Hello. Um, here to address the procurement policy that's been advertised now for four weeks. Is there any questions? No. Did anything in? Oh, we did not. Then I would like to recommend to adopt the policy. So moved. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes for the new you. policy. You're welcome. We will move on to item eight now because we switched the previous two in the beginning. It is time for public comments, and I, of course, see visitors here. Um, thank you for coming. We're definitely interested to hear what you have to say. What we normally do so we can keep on track with the business and the agenda that's been set and worked on for over a week now. Um, Council, is that still a time frame for speaking? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Superintendent, three minutes, or would you like? Uh, that is what your core policy is, yes, yes ma'am. Okay. So you can get up in any order that you'd like. Um, our council will take time. Generally, you're not going to hear from each board member after your speak, but Mr. Superintendent will be taking notes, and he can contact you at a future date and go over more personalized information. OK, so whoever would like to come up, please come up to the podium. You can state your name. That would be wonderful. and. Please let us know what you're thinking. My name, is, my name is Rachel Maynard, and my son Octavius goes to Major Coast Middle School, and um, he has an IEP 504 plan. And they had a um, for the last two years, I believe, because my middle son also did the Sherry Root program. And Nature Coast is a smaller school, so I liked it. And um, so anyway, they don't have sports and stuff like that that um, require your grades to stay up um, in order to stay on the sport. And the Shuri Ru, the martial arts program, did require that. They required that you keep a, a C average or above. Okay, so my son, he gets you know, most teenage boys, they get, you know, they'll start slacking and stuff like that. Well, he did, and he was getting behind on his work, and they told him, you know, he can't be in the Sherry Room Martial Arts program if he doesn't get his grades up, and it, it really helped him get his grades up. Well, 
they had canceled the program just a couple weeks ago um, at another meeting we went to with the school and a parent came in and offered to pay they they canceled the program saying that they didn't have the funds for it a parent offered to pay the seven thousand dollars and they denied it so we're basically all here for the same reason because it's a good program a great program for not just my kid and their kids all the kids that go to it you know um that's pretty much it like I wish that it could stay in school, you know. I would hate to have to move my son to Chiefland Middle High, but if it doesn't get back to it, that's probably what I'm gonna have to do because he's gonna have to be in something that makes his grades, you know. It gives a motivation to want to get good grades because that's the whole point of being in school in the first place, you know. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So your I'm gonna question if you don't mind. So oh, your board denied it, correct? Uh, your, the board at Nature Coast and I. Yes. 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 Right. Okay. Because and it was all a thing with another teacher. Right. They're all for. And so I think it's a wonderful program, and I admire too you know, that your son's going through that. But just um, not speaking out of turn or anything, but I think that you know, it, to understand that it is your board that um, handles that, and our board is that correct, Mr. Superintendent? That does right. not decide that. Okay. I would I love that you came to our meeting and that you are speaking out about that, but. Have you addressed your board too? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We went to the meeting and everything, and there was basically they were saying that there's nothing that they can do about it. So we we're basically trying to see what else we can do about it. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. And then, unfortunately, so with that, so um, you know, they they are the controlling on, on Nature Coast. They're they're separate from with them being a charter school. So we we do provide funding the state we're a flow through entity and we provide some services to them so but as far as so how they operate it would fall under the purview of their board so okay okay you're welcome anyone else is still welcome to speak okay. thank you guys thank you, have a great thank, day. you. Right, thank, thank you, you. <coughs> my name is Sarah Townsend. I also have um, this past year I had two children enrolled there um, but th all three of my girls went there. Um, my youngest daughter, who just turned 12, decided to enroll in Nature Coast because of this program. Um, she wanted to be a part of it. All three of my girls have participated. Um, however, like Ms. Brooklyn said, with the board of the school, the problem is with that, um, we have addressed it with them. I was myself not in attendance because I had to work. But my concerns were spoken to about that. Um, the board consists of the teachers that we are having trouble with at the school. Um, Mr. Bell, who is the principal, Ms. Monday, who also has a large part to do in the school, and Ms. I don't Allison. remember Ms. Allison's last Ms. name. Allison. Is that her last name? Um, I don't think so. But anyway, Ms. Allison. Um, who used to be the principal of the middle school there also. Um, they are, they make up the board, they make up the parent um, council, or, or I'm not exactly sure of the legality terms of that. Um, so they're the ones that we're getting trouble, we're having trouble getting through. They're the problems we're having trouble with. Um, there's been speculation about Miss Monday, who was one of them. Um, having financial issues with the school and messing with the fundraising money. Um, I don't have the, all the details on that. That's just, you know, been speculated. Um, but she's one of the people that we're trying to get through. Now, like she said, a parent offered to pay the salary of this program for the year. Um, the excuse was from the board is that it was in the budget cut and they didn't have the budget for it. That was the only reason. Then the parent offered to pay the budget for it. They still denied it. Um, the two teachers that we are having the issues with, Miss Monday and Miss Allison, um, we found out had threatened to put in their resignation if the program was to stay. Now the program does offer all of the children, which I think we have what 28 kids, yeah, 30 kids in that program. Each and every one of them have above AC average in the school. Each and every one of them participate in the fundraising for not only Sherry Rue activities, but for school activities as well for everybody there. Um, 
our that school went from a D rated school to a B plus in the town that he was there. It's not just the program, it's the teacher who taught the program as well. Um, he's done countless things for the community, um, for our Levy County community, um, also Yokers County because he lives in Bell. So, you know, it's not just the program that we're concerned with, it's the teacher. Um, like I said, the other teachers are refusing that chair. So work with him? Three minutes. Okay. Okay, sorry. So, not, to, <laughs> not to interrupt you, just right. so we can get through everybody and then just continue with business. Okay, yep. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'm just trying to get somewhere past them since they keep putting up a roadblock. Thank you, Mrs. Townsend. Yeah. Anyone else? Sure, and, and I was just going to say, you know, from a legal perspective, that's how the law sets up charter schools, that this board doesn't have the authority to tell them who to hire or not, or what teacher to work in what position, or what after school programs to have or not have. Um, <coughs> that's, that's the final decision of your charter school board. Um, and I don't want to speak out of turn, and I'll, I can... Um, maybe talk with the superintendent. I believe the district does have some after school programs at on campus sites, and maybe this is a program that, that we'd be able to accommodate. I don't know anything about this martial arts program and don't know if that would be possible or if we have the space or any of those things, but that's something I certainly would be willing to work with the superintendent on um, to see if that would be a possibility. But this board does not legally have the authority to override the decisions that your charter school board is making. Right. Yeah. That that part we understand. Okay. Um, it's the I just want it to be known that they're putting up such a. Gotcha. Thing, you know what I mean. I know you only have about a minute left. I wasn't actually going to say anything, but I paid attention to the budget and everything like that, and the growth that the schools had. And if you put this sensei at your school, you're going to actually bring in more kids because they want the program. Not every kid wants to play football. Uh, a lot of us did growing up, but that was kind of where we were. I was <coughs> well, there was very few options on it. You bring in Sensei, you're going to bring in more kids. You're going to bring in another discipline into the school. And I mean that as a, in the, not in the sense of punishment, in the sense of pride, you know. And I know a lot of athletics, you're required to keep a certain GPA, you would be doing the same thing. Um, he's brought a lot into the community, but you're also looking at kids who are going to have after-school programs, but you're looking at kids who are going to have summertime programs because his goes year-round. So you would have somebody that is vested to be able to go to major competitions and bring in a different type of trophy, a different type of activity, something that other kids, we've wa I've watched a lot of these students, very insecure, get very confident. You want your testing to go up? Give the kids confidence. Maybe. Give them something else that they can do that they can earn their confidence in themselves. Thank you. Would you state your name as well, please? Matthew Leitner, ma'am. Matthew Leitner. Leitner. Thank you, Mr. Leitner. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Had my son in dojo. I know exactly what you meant from me. Very young age. Made him focus. Made him do really yes, neat stuff. So thank you so much for coming and sharing everything with us. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, or you can... <laughs> Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank Come you on, it's coming. just getting thank exciting. You. <laughs> <laughs>
He's in AP classes. He ended up failing one class. He is currently in summer school at Williston Middle High School to do credit recovery so he can pass that class. When I called the school to find out why he was no longer going to be accepted as an out-of-area student, I got one of three different answers when I talked to the administration there. The first answer I got was, we're in the business of running a school. They're building new homes in Williston every day. We had to forecast for future student development and growth. Okay. They're building new homes. They're not building. No one's moved into a barn yet. Uh, next answer I got was, we're over capacity. I can understand that. And the third and final answer I got was, our decision is final and we based it upon these criteria, overcrowding, new homes being built, influx of students in the area moving in from Ocala and Um I spoke to your office, Mr. Coward. I believe I may have spoke to you. Mr. Lott, so. Okay. Um, during that conversation, you said that we should have been contacted directly by the school. We were not. And as far as I know, no parent of any student at Williston Middle High School that is out of area, even by, like my son, 300 yards, has been personally contacted by any member of that school's administration to explain to them why to give them a concrete answer. Uh, I'm not here to throw stones and cast aspersions and use $500 words because I don't do that when I'm not at work. I have it on pretty good authority. Williston Middle High School's hired two new co uh, sports coaches. I also have it on pretty good authority that those coaches are bringing in kids to play high school ball from Gainesville, Ocala. So are we taking the kids that have lived in that community One minute left. to okay. that have been to that school and have been going to that school, have friends and relationships at that school, are we kicking them out so we can win a ball game? Mr. Young, okay. the, the policy agreement is up on I apologize I understand. To, interrupt, I understand. to interrupt you. Um, so I, I'll, I will speak to, so at each principal, so principals and, and the school admin take a look at this. So we are, we're at over capacity at Wilson and we have been, which is why in January of last year, I brought to this board about redrawing district attendance lines. So that, that happened. So there is, we do have to forecast and we do have to make sure that we have capacity for students as they come in. So we are over capacity at Williston Middle High School. Levy County is a school choice. So. I'll be happy to talk to, to Dr. Hancock and see. So if there's anything else, and I'll apologize to you up front because you should have been contacted the first time you should have got. I had to leave work to come here to actually see someone so. because trying to get a hold of Dr. Hancock or anybody at that school. So. I, and understand, so it is the time of year where I, we're, and I understand we're scattered that. with state I conventions mean. and professional leave. So, but I, I will say that you should have been contacted before than just getting a letter. So. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Yeah. We'll move on to item nine, approval of the minutes from the June eleventh board meeting. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes for approval of the minutes. Move on to item 10, consent agenda. Mrs. Brookins, would you like to start? Certainly. Um, I have met with um, our superintendent. He's gone over in detail all the questions and um, provided expert answers, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brookins. Mr. Whitehurst. Yes, uh, superintendent answered my questions. I did want to uh, point out we're certainly going to have a great loss of Lewis and Aaron Owens at the Wilson Elementary School. I didn't realize her original hire date, August 24th, 1989. So yeah. she was a great voice and leader at that school. You know, always car pickup line and just energetic and just really helped lift up a lot of people around her. So she's surely going to be missed. 
that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitehurst. Mrs. Clements. All my questions were answered. I'm going to echo what um, Devin said. Her, Ms. Owens, her energy is contagious, and it's a huge loss for Williston. Thank you. Mr. Asper. All my questions were answered. Thank you. Um, I would just like to mention that I, I just know Teresa um, Moldeen. I know she went from Cedar Key to Williston, and she's just a, she's a great teacher, and she will be missed. It's not as long as the other ones, but she's yeah, a very absolutely. good math teacher, so she will be missed as well. And I had one other question on the mobility instructional it's not the instructional. The e, the e -luma. Was there a change in that? It went up. Was there, um, I didn't get that answer, and I know Mrs. Lake had to leave, so that might be, need to be directed to her. I see the email. So, the so that was for was Williston. $1,200. So there's Wilson. three new students at WCCA that will be so providing services to. So yes, so that's okay. that's the reason. Okay. Thank you. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. So moved. moved. Second. A motion and a second. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Hearing none, motion passes for the consent agenda. Item 11, finance. Make a motion to approve. Second. second. A motion and a second. Any other further, further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes for the finance. Mr. Superintendent. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, so you'll see there are a lot of moving parts. So with the consent agenda, so a new hire, so we're excited. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Maria is coming to us so to come in before coordinator of literacy so and uh, really really excited that this week we've been having professional learning so we've got uh, teachers over at Chico Middle High School that are doing a 40 point uh, recertification class so and uh, dealing with, with reading and uh, just appreciate the hard work as you see the hard work uh, of Dr. Hanlon and what goes into the accreditation. So this is the second time that Levy County has gone through the accreditation process and um, just was really, really pleasantly surprised and uh, thankful for the hard work because the last time was a part of that process as a board member and I know that our, our school-based admin had a much heavier lift um, and our district staff really, um, and which kind of goes hand in hand. So, and I know that we kind of, we talked about testing and different things like that. As you see, um, we are in a situation where the majority of the uh, College of Education are not turning out teachers. And so as we have people that are coming in from uh, as a second career or, or basically as an alternative pathway, anything we can do to support them, so with, with these projects, so whether it's helping with the test bank, so through performance matter, or with helping with the, uh, basically the scaffolding and, and working on uh, the cadres coming together, that's another reason why our sub costs have gone up is because we took and we brought our teachers, our experts here to kind of help with some of these things to kind of better help our new teachers. So you have uh, see that we now have three district mentor teachers. So you see that the district is actively pushing back into our classrooms to help support teachers day in and day out here. So and uh, just thank you for for you guys recognizing the need and how showing, and yes, we do. We talk a lot about data, but I think data is what helps drive decisions to make sound decisions and make sure that as we bring you guys things that cost dollars and cents, that you guys have all the information needed to help continue to move our district forward as we have over the last almost four years. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Mrs. Brookins? Um, thanks to the hard work everybody's doing this summer, because I know there's a lot, and there's a lot that's going on, and. Um, Dr. Hanlon, I, once again, with that process, I don't want your job at all. <laughs> That's a lot. And I, I do. I was here, too, the first time. It was, it was mind-blowing. <laughs> but that, that is a lot. Um, and um, and I, I agree one more time. We mentioned it last board meeting, but Breezy brought it up. And those kids that go to the conventions and things, it's just 
it's amazing and I, I really am glad they all have that opportunity and, and can do that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brookins. Mr. Whitehurst. Yeah, well, thank, uh, thank you for your presentation, Ms. Hanlon and Ms. Lake and, you know, all the hard work administration, you know, and I know they're doing a lot of them kind of going to training and different stuff. So they got a lot going on to try to balance everything and uh, just had a FFA, you know, had pretty good as a state winner from Chief Fund and and got it. We have one in OH demo for Williston and from second place on some stuff. So just right there at the cusp right. on a couple of things. But it was uh, it was it was good. It's a good convention. It's also nice to see all them kids just working and stuff. And you know, everybody's having. A, hope everybody have a good summer and be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitehurst, Mr. Williams. The same. I want to thank Miss Hanlon, Miss Lake, um, for their presentations. Um, Great things are happening in our county. Yankee Town, the lower 25th, the lower quartile of Yankee Town, um, has achieved a 75% gain, which is huge, because um, that's just a big jump. And I, we're on track to being an A if they don't change the grading scale right for Cedar Key and Yankee Town. Is that July? Decided in July. July 24th. Yeah. State so board, fingers yes. crossed. Right now we're tracking for an A. So um, super excited about that. And we received, Yankee Town received a private donation, which um, thank you to Ms. Taylor for being creative and doing all the work that she does to get that money used um, for a STEAM program in Yankee Town, which will be a great addition. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mrs. Kamenzi. Mr. Asbel. The only thing I have is, is, is to reiterate what others have said. Uh, tremendous amount of work went into a couple presentations today. Um, and in my opinion, one of those presentations, the budget, the beginning of the budget workshop is one of the most important things this board has to deal with. It's, it may be the single most important thing the school board does. Um, and I'll be honest, I am bothered because there should be people that that affects in those seats. And, it, and every year we have this meeting and the very people that that affects aren't sitting there. You know, in reality, the budget personally does not affect me. But if I was in a position that that budget affected me, I'd be sitting there because I want to hear. I want to know the truth. That way I know, hey, the budget is this many millions of dollars. This much goes to this. This much goes to that. It doesn't require a great understanding of budgets. It's just basic math. And you sit here and, oh, okay. So that when you ask a representative or anyone that has been at this meeting, hey, how much money did they allocate to this? You've heard it yourself. Um, every year, this time of year, we have that meeting, and it looks just like that. We will meet again in July about this. So I want people to hear this, and you can call Cameron a jerk, because Cameron, Cameron's big. He can hold the load. I'd like to see somebody that it affects sitting out there. So if you're listening to me, I don't care if you're paid to be here. I don't care if you volunteered to be here. I don't care. Be here. Because it affects you. You know, you need to know. All right? Look at the thing. This is where your salary comes from. This is where your benefits come from. Hey, this is how we buy the textbooks. This is why it takes a while to get a roof put on. Know every aspect of what you do. So I challenge whomever wants to come to come to the next meeting because it's important. It affects your life. I'd be here. Now that's me getting on a soapbox and somebody's bound to call me and somebody's bound to be upset with me. But again, Cameron's a big grown boy. I can tote that. So call me if you have a problem with it. But come see us next time. Because I'm sure you got questions too. That's all I have now. Thank you, Mr. Asbell. I agree with that. It would be nice to see more faces in those chairs. <laughs> it really would because it's great to hear their voices. Even with the visitors today even though it was nature coast ah. as a group it's nice for them to see that we're going to sit here and listen you know it don't even have to be an I, parents okay. people come see it this is why it's open to the or public we can move everybody in the back forward <laughs> yes <laughs> Just um summer program down in cedar key is going well i know they take field trips every thursday uh, so they are enjoying it and I was able to spend a little bit of time with Mr. Slemp yesterday and what Miss Ashley said 
um, he said as well for the quartile down, the lowest quartile down in Cedar Key, that they also had that 75% improvement. So he was very pleased about that. Yeah, it was great. He was reading all the scores at the um, at the SAC meeting yesterday afternoon, and uh, that it was just great to hear. Congratulations. I know it's not on the consent agenda, but to Miss Jesse Crosby down in Cedar Key. She is moving into the dean position, and I'm sure she'll be helping Mr. Slump with some of the administration, then I think it's going to be wonderful, and I can't wait to watch her grow. So she's, it's, it's exciting to see. And just the other thing, hope maybe they can, <clears throat> when they get back, they might be coming back soon, but Marissa Dehaven started that touring um, capability again to take the kids on a trip, and they're overseas. But seeing the pictures on Facebook, what those children are experiencing is unlike any, anything. You know, who knows if they'll ever get to do it again. But maybe they, when they get back at the beginning of the year or during the summer, they can <clears throat> give us a little, a little uh, recap. Sp speech. <laughs> yeah, yeah, recap of, of where they've been and what they saw and how, how it touched them. So I'm looking, looking forward to talking with them. And it'll be a few weeks before we meet again, so enjoy your summer, and that's all I have. There's no further business. Meeting is adjourned.